Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Quiet Light Podcast. I'm here today with Joe Valley. How are you, Joe? I'm here. I'm alive. I'm doing well. How are you doing, Pat? Great. We had a great segment today talking with Chelsea about the acquisition lab and uh, and how they can help you buy a business and be able to take it forward, to, whether it's your next career or something you're adding to your current business. You talk about somebody that's really, really smart, even slows people down in certain situations when they get so excited about this. It's so amazing to hear how they help people get into businesses and especially even how to, you know, take the first six to nine months and be smart about how their growth is. It's just amazing conversation. Really, really smart lady. Yeah, it, for folks, it all stems from uh, Walker Dibel's book, uh, Buy Then Build, and then he built the acquisition lab. And Chelsea runs it for him. I think she's got some ownership as well. If she doesn't, she should. By the end of this podcast, Walker's probably going to send Pat and I an email, you know, threatening us for saying that she needs to be a partner. But I think she is because she runs the lab and she does it incredibly well. And the benefits of it is that, you know, there is a structure that helps people um, go through each phase of buying a business in a cohort with, uh, I think, 17 to 22 to 23 people each quarter. And it, it keeps you, uh, energized and focused and not making mistakes or giving up. And that's the key thing. They've had uh, 80 successful people uh, with closed transactions. They've got several hundred people in the lab. They've got 12 counselors or not counselors. They've got 12 advisors from different segments of the industry that are advising on different topics from attorneys to entrepreneurs that have built businesses with lots of different businesses involved. Uh, they've got lenders. They've got everybody that you need in order to you know, get all of your ducks in a row to buy a business and do it properly and yeah. mitigate risk, which is the key because you do it once, Pat, and you fail, what happens? It's kind of hard yeah. to do it the next time, right? It costs you a lot of money. And also probably along the way, if you make mistakes, you're going to pay the money that you would normally go in and do something like this anyway, if you make mistakes. I think it's so important to get the value of perfect information around you to understand these processes, whether you're exiting or buying. And just to, to, you know, also talk a little more about what you said. Walker is such an amazing guy. He's so smart. Don't say that. Don't, build, no, 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 which, no, 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 no. He's going to, well, he's going to clip that and then he's going to send it to us and it's going to play every time we talk to him. And oh, well, we can't, but I think no, you would even no, say no. it's by then build is the second best selling book in, in quite light history. Right. So, I mean, he's got that for him. It's an exciting <laughs> part of this. I mean, the, the fact that he can help you be able to do those things and, and take them forward is amazing. Obviously Walker's a huge asset and having someone like her on his team is is absolutely amazing. I think I think she uh, lines out a lot of things people should really think about if they're thinking about changing careers or buying business. It's amazing. So I, I know that everyone's anxious to hear about it. So let's get right to it. Chelsea, welcome to the Quiet Life Podcast. How are you? Wonderful. Thanks for having me. Well, Pat and I know you through Walker Dibel, who of course is a member of the team and prolific author and writer and movie director, producer, or something along those lines. Um, he's, he's, as we said, a man that doesn't really know what he wants to do with his life. So he's just doing everything, which I applaud <laughs> in many ways. But he's him interesting. Yeah, it does. But you run the acquisition lab for him. And as I, as I said to Pat earlier, he, he works for you. As far as I'm concerned, when it comes to the acquisition lab, you run it, you tell him what to do, which is a great setup. Um, but for those that don't know what the Acquisition Lab is and you personally, can you uh, give us a little background? Yeah, so we designed the Acquisition Lab to model like uh, startup accelerators, right? Think Y Combinator. Um, but we did it so that it could support people instead of starting a business, buying an existing business. And so there's an education component. There is a hand-holding component with a group of advisors. Uh, Walker was very adamant that it not be the Walker Dival Show. Uh, and so we have a team, I think we have 12 advisors now um, that help. They give diverse experience, diverse uh, perspectives. Um, we always say in the lab, there's no right way to buy a business. And so giving our members access to different perspectives and um, I guess sometimes even competing advice, right? Like mm. but they're, they're both good options. It's just you have to decide what's best for you. Um, and so it's a very, very strong community, uh, highly vetted. Um, it's one of the things that we take great pride in is that I won't take someone's money if I don't think I can actually help them buy a business. Um, and so as a result, we have had uh, just north of 80 closings since October of 2020. Uh, we have about 450 members, a little north of that, I think. Um, and so I'm just very grateful um, for our members and being able to support them. Um, and they continue supporting each other. It's 
I feel very blessed to have created the lab. For for those listening that have bought businesses through Quiet Light and whatnot, um, why does somebody need help? I, this is just such a loaded question, isn't that? Why does anybody need help buying a business? I don't know. It's so simple. Um, well, not everybody does need help, right? Some people buy businesses just using YouTube videos and books, and that's totally fine, right? The lab was created for people that that doesn't work for them, right? They want a community. They want guidance. They want a coach. They want somebody to kind of like get them through the process, give them feedback, um, help be a thought partner for them. Um, and so most of the people that join the lab are looking for the community aspect and structure, accountability and confidence, I guess, right? Being around all those people, um, seeing people close, it's the social proof that mm. our brains need to take a leap in something. And um, I think the lab does that. Um, and it's kind of, so part of my background, um, so I'm an industrial organizational psychologist. So you'll hear me say IO psychology, that's wow. what I mean. Um, and so back in my early career, days of my career, I would do career coaching for people and, and helping them craft a resume. And at the end of getting that resume, you would have such confidence, right, in your ability to get this job you were applying to. And the lab does the same thing, right? It gives them confidence that they can actually execute. We go through a similar process, actually, that I used to go through with our members, kind of helping them to find who they are as a buyer, uh, what company they should be buying, what role they should be playing. Um, we look at partnerships to make sure the partnerships are balanced and if not, what they need to be looking for in the entities that they're acquiring. Um, and so not everybody needs the lab, right? If you're a lone wolf and you want to do it on your own, more power to you. We've gotten lots of emails from those folks thanking Walker for writing his book, uh, thanking us for posting videos on YouTube. Um, but for those that want a community and a group of people to kind of be a thought partner, that those are the people that join the lab. Chelsea, when I think about this a little bit, it's like, you know, we have a saying at Quite Light, a lot of times we banter this around that you don't know what you don't know. And I think your business is probably really linked to that, that people that don't come into the acquisition lab can be successful if they know the 80-20 of getting through a transaction. But don't you feel like you guys can add value in directions that most people wouldn't think about, even if it's a small thing to help someone along? Is that kind of the philosophy that you take getting forward in the acquisition lab? Yeah. And so I, I think... I personally, obviously, like you can't call my baby ugly kind of thing. Like I think the lab can provide value to anyone, whether you've done one or 10 transactions, right? Because every transaction is different. There isn't a right way. I can't give you a checklist, a roadmap, a, a thing to do in every transaction because they're also very different. Um, and so what the lab does is it gives you a place to go where you're like, what, the <laughs> like, what is this thing that I need to now deal with? Um, how do I handle that and, and trust that someone there has been through it and can kind of coach you through it and know that that feedback is is quality? Um, I think a lot of people will rely on Twitter. They'll rely on like we have a free Facebook group with 9000 people in it or something, 8000 people in it. Um, and there are people giving advice there left and right. I can't speak right towards the value of that. Could it get you through in a pinch? Possibly. Could it sure. get you in a bigger pinch? It's totally possible. Um, I try to correct misinformation as much as I can, but the lab just gives you, you, you just don't know what's going to come up. The craziest shit comes up in every deal, right? And and it's not a textbook thing. You can't go look up in the M&A guide and, and see how to handle it. You really need to talk through it. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could just look it up and go, okay, <laughs> they're lying about the, the, whatever it is, you know, trying to new, renegotiate for no no good reason, just because they think they're supposed to. <laughs> uh, it, it would be nice. I love the fact that you've got 12 different advisors with different perspectives and views and sometimes competing views. Uh, and then you've got all of the people who have completed purchases that might be piping in with scenarios and maybe they had the same issue and then they solved it a certain way and and it can throw their, their hat in the ring as well. That's brilliant. Well, it just kind of helps you figure out what's right for you, right? We talk about branding and how important branding is and understanding who you are as a buyer. Um, and it goes for the same thing. Like when you're listening to advice, like somebody that's a completely different human than you might be balls to the wall negotiator, right? Like they go hard and they get what they want and blah, blah, blah. like that. If that's not you, then their approach isn't going to work for you. Right. And does then, that approach they, work for anyone? Uh, some people say <laughs> not what we coach in the lab, but some I, people say. Actually, I have a, a friend that was from New York and his business partner negotiated deals just that way. 
and they were buying, I don't know if it was like a piece of real estate with a convenience store or something, a house, whatever. It was a business related thing. And there was a, uh, they were at the closing table. And I think the guy made up at the closing table with Jerry sitting right beside him. Did you get the, re- the tank removed from the yard? And the guy was like, what are you talking about the tank? He's like, there's a propane tank, blah, 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 blah. This $15,000 to have that removed. You didn't do that. Deal's off. And then they renegotiated on the spot. The guys took $15,000 off on the spot. There was no tank in the yard. He made it up completely at the closing table. That's the wrong person to do business with. I just <laughs> tell you. They wouldn't be allowed in the lab, I assume, right? Nope. No, but that's what's so funny about why I love the lab and why I, maybe I'm not the person to take it to $10 million or something, because like those types of humans, I will not let into the lab. Like I do all of our strategy calls, sales calls, whatever you want to call them for that reason. And if, and I'll push back on a call and how somebody handles my pushback tells me a lot about whether or not I want to talk to them ever again in my life. Mm -hmm. And I've had quite a few calls where I'm like, have you heard of insert someone else's program? And they're like, are you telling me to go buy a competing program? I'm like, yes, I am. Enjoy. Enjoy it. Yeah. Chelsea, I have a question for you uh, to go back to something you said early. Uh, you said you vet people really well. So I have two full questions that number one, what is that criteria? Because people may not understand what kind of qualifications they need to get involved. And the second part is, if that's the case, how is Walker still involved? <laughs> I can't get rid of him. Um, no, I, I am so very grateful that I met Walker um, and that I've had this opportunity. I could never do anything close to this without him. And then, yeah, we won't even. He, yeah, I'm very grateful for him. Vetting, though, for the um, lab members. So some of it's just gut, right? Like how they handle the call. Like if I have somebody come on the call like hard and go, why should I pick you over Cody Sanchez? And I'm like, maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't want that kind of energy on a daily basis in my life. And I sure as hell don't want to subject my other members to it. Um, but the big main criteria that I'm looking for on those calls is like, the first thing is like, is the person actually going to find value in what we provide? We've only had three refunds out of 450 people two of which I own completely. One, I didn't vet very well. well two, I didn't vet very well. Um, one was like this beautiful human. Um, and I just don't know what went wrong. Um, he was an older gentleman and he just got really mad that we were on Zoom calls. And I don't know what he thought was going to happen. And like, he, I think he called me a charlatan and I felt really bad. Uh, so I obviously did not vet that very well. Um, and then another one was just not a good fit for the community. And then the other one was imposter syndrome. Honestly, he should have mm. stayed. I could have gotten through it, but he just was scared. Yeah. I get that. So we so. vet so heavily because I don't want to take someone's money if they can't actually execute on buying a business. And so that means that they have a strong business background um, or that they have a clear value proposition with how they plan on adding value to a company. It doesn't mean that you're an executive, right? It doesn't mean that you've been a vice president or that you've owned a business. If you're a digital marketer and you plan on buying a business, then that's cool, right? If you're a product manager and you have a clear line of growth on buying a business, that's fine too. Um, the second thing is um, I want to make sure that they're going to add value. Um, and part of that too is this is probably the main reason I exclude people from being um, in the lab is can you actually achieve what you're trying to achieve based off of your funds, your strategies, like the number one thing that I boil every call down to is like, do you need to draw money out of this business? And if so, how much, right? Like how much, if this is replacing an income for you, how much is necessary in order for you to sustain living? And then we talk through the numbers of the deal size they're targeting. The number of people that still believe that SDE is how much they can take home blows my mind. I'm like, well, how are you buying the business? Are you paying cash? They're like, no, I'm going to do net debt. I'm like, oh, how much leverage? They're like 90%. I'm like, how are you paying them back? <laughs> do we understand how debt works? Mm -hmm. Um, right. And just making sure that they don't buy a business and then end up screwed because they can't pay themselves anything because they bought a really small business thinking they were going to pay themselves 250,000, but in essence, they could clear 40 after, you know, trying to grow the business. So, um, that's probably the largest reason I don't let people in. Um, and the last thing is I just want to talk to you again. If I never want to talk to you again, which is a rarity, then you're probably an asshole and I don't want to deal with you on a daily basis. I like that policy. (laughs) <laughs> One of the things that you said earlier was it, it provides structure for people, which I think is brilliant, right? I, I think first, if they pay for it and there's structure, they paid for it. So they're going to work a little harder and commit to it and stick with that structure and go through. Um, 
and that obviously there's a process and they learn certain things, not everything all at once. Um, but you said you had uh, about 80 uh, closed transactions so far. I'm curious, do you keep track of or have a ballpark idea of how long it takes somebody once they start to uh, when they actually buy a business, what the average is? So of the closings, it's about eight to 10 months from when they join, if it's under about a million in um, SDE or EBITDA. Once it goes over a million in EBITDA, it'll stretch out, right? Because there's just fewer deals available that are that are of substance. And so um, not to say we don't still have people searching, right, that are past that threshold, but just looking at our closings, typically they close eight, eight to 10 months. We have some that are doing it faster. We've had some in I think our fastest was actually three months, which is crazy. They came, but they came with deal in hand. Yeah. Right. And yeah. it actually worked out, which is very unusual. <laughs> yeah. I think eight to eight to 10 months makes sense. And I think that's why um, having support and structure is really, really critical because if somebody says, all right, I'm going to buy an online business and I'm just going to start looking at quiet lights listings. Well, first of all, they're going to be competing with three other buyers every time. Cause we've had an average of three offers on every business for the last well year to date. I did it podcast with Pat yesterday and we looked at the yeah. year to date numbers. Um, and second, it's just so easy to get, you know, disappointed and give up that you don't have that community around you when you're just doing it on your own. And then you, you know, you're going to lean on Pat who actually technically represents the seller, not the buyer. And he's going to say, well, for due diligence, go to the partner page, look at the due diligence firms, but there's no more support than that. Of course, we'll provide attorneys and whatnot, but that's it. I love the community aspect of what you're doing. I think it makes a huge difference for people. I think so. And I think that sometimes it's hard to get out of our own heads. So like I do most of the one-on-one -on -one stuff with our members. If they're just in a, I don't want to say crisis because nothing's life or death, right? But like where they just feel like they're either failing or they're not getting the results they're looking for. A lot of times they'll jump on my calendar or my couch, as they call it, and kind of talk through whatever they're they're struggling with and so I think that when you're alone in your search and you don't have anybody to talk to about it it has a higher likelihood of you giving up right because any friction point causes our brains to shift back to where our comfort is right like I just had a call with a prospect and she was saying like I don't have anyone to talk to about this I talk to strangers and so I really appreciate that you've just given me your time and I'm like it's fine I mean I could talk all day about this stuff I get excited about it um, but I get excited about it because I love the idea of supporting our communities and allowing our communities to continue to grow and thrive with the small businesses that have existed, you know. Um, but I also really like the idea of helping people not make mistakes. Like I know a lot of I'm helping a family member who is bought a business and before I did all of this um, and is, is struggling now um, with the partnership aspect of it. What, what are some of those mistakes that people make? I think number one, and every lender that I know, please cl close your ears, uh, um, okay. is that they project for growth their first year, right? Like projecting for growth your first year is just, especially at like crazy growth, 10, 15% when the business historically has never grown over four, right? Is, is just challenging. But from a change management perspective, anytime you, you introduce change into a system, and that's what a business is, it's a system, it's going to cause disruption, right? And with disruption comes a drop of productivity. And so I think buying a business and, and operating on a forecast, which we all know the value of forecast, um, but operating on a forecast that's projecting growth is just setting yourself up for, for failure, or not failure, but pain. Um, earmuffs back off for our lenders, your lenders love to see growth in the first year. Um, and so your business plans are, are um, important, um, but it's also important to manage your expectations. So right? for, for your business plan for the lender, project growth, but don't plan for that financially for yourself. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I would actually like your primary goal is just to sustain historical performance. Because most deals, at least in my experience, hit that kind of like a rocky point during the transaction historically before closing, where it's like, maybe it didn't decline, but it certainly wasn't growing because the seller lost focus, right? And they started focusing on the transition. And so your goal is just to get that stability back um, and then hopefully poise it for growth. We've had members that have grown tremendously their first year. So right. don't get me wrong. It's possible. I just yeah. think it's dangerous to plan for it. When I sold my business, it was a long time ago, 2010. Um, 
there was a recurring revenue and it was sold in November. I'm like, look, man, people are going to go crazy in first quarter. That's when they, you know, use my products and whatnot uh, to, uh, you know, to build up the recurring revenue. I said, don't do anything new for six months. Just sit back and watch and listen. So like, don't break this. It's, it's, it's not in need of fixing. Don't break it. And unfortunately, you know, I sold it in November by June. He calls me and uh, says, Joe, would you consider reinvesting in the business? I'm like, oh no, what happened? And he just completely overspent. He tripled the advertising cost uh, January 1st and it, it, it didn't pay off. Um, so I think not breaking it is really, really important if it doesn't need to be fixed. And I think that most people come in and put their own touch and spin on the business, just like you would in a house. You're going to go paint rooms and things of that nature. I think it's really, really important to sit back and operate it, but don't make any dramatic changes in the first few months. What do you, what do you think of that? hundred percent. Yeah. I think the other big mistake, and this is where like Walker and I will openly debate in front of lab members and they can decide what, what is right. But like, I think telling an employee base that nothing is going to change is the stupidest thing a seller or a buyer could do. Really? Tell me why. Yes. Because you're creating a psychological contract with your workforce that nothing's going to change when you have every intention of changing things, right? Talk them mm -hmm. through, like, I'm not going to change anything right now, mm -hmm. right? Right now, I'm just going to learn the business. And then I'm going to leverage you guys and your experience. And I'm going to understand what you think needs to change. And then we're going to do it together. Because you wouldn't buy a business and not change it. That's interesting. I, I would imagine that Walker's point is don't upset the apple cart. We don't want employees that are transferring with a sale to jump ship because they're, they're fearful that there's going to be a lot of change. What you're saying is there's going to be change, but not yet. And then the change that's going to happen, we'll do together so we can utilize Correct. your expertise. Engage your workforce and they'll stay with you. They're already, they already know change is going to happen. Now you're just a liar. Like, right. Right? This is this is this is going to be a clip that you can use. You want to pull this down and share it from you know with Walker all the time. I think Pat, would you agree with me? Chelsea seems a whole lot smarter than Walker does. <laughs> I, I don't think there's any question about that. That's not a that's not a high bar to jump over, unfortunately. But I think she definitely has. Chelsea, you, you make some really good points because the one thing about this kind of situation is it feels like there's almost a continuing education once people get in there. Buying a business is one thing, but understanding how to wait that six months and be patient like you all talked about. Most people don't think about that because they buy it. They want to run and they want to go and they want to implement their thoughts. So is there a perfect type of entrepreneur or person that comes into the acquisition lab? Is it someone that's never been in e-commerce so they don't have predetermined ideas? What's, what's a perfect client for you to guide them through this process? Well, good question. I mean, our members are all over the place. They're buying every type of business, every size of business, every location you could imagine, right? We have online distribution, manufacturing, service, like anything you can imagine. And I don't think that there is a specific type of person other than someone that wants to buy a business and wants to mitigate risk, because that's really what the lab is going to do, right? As long as you're open to feedback, hell, you don't even have to implement the feedback, <laughs> right? Just listen, right. right, to the diverse perspectives and figure out what the best path forward is for you. Like we we always say our job and our role is never to say you should or shouldn't buy a business. We will never tell you that. Full disclosure, I have said it once. Um, what we will say is here's our concern, right? Here's what we see. And then you can do what you want. I have had conversations where members go and do whatever the hell they want. And then afterwards, I'm like, mm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> right? But it's like, it's everybody can choose what the hell they want. That's the fun thing of life, right? Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a game of chance. Are there certain skills that you want them to come in with? Let's say, for instance, you want them to understand how to read a PL. Let's just say, like, I'll give you a great example. My wife is retiring this year. She's never really truly run a business, even though she's been around it. Is that the kind of person that you can guide along in the process that's even better and more fruitful because they don't have predetermined notions on where they're going? Is that is that a positive or is that a negative? I'm gonna give the best consulting answer that I've ever given in my career. It depends. <laughs> It, it there really isn't like we can help her figure out what her value is right to a business in the same way that we could help like we have a member who is probably like if if i was drawing like an avatar of our ideal um client it would not be him right he has three degrees from ivy league schools 
right? He's been leading a major tr- multi-million, like we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars worth of a business, right? But he joined the lab and got tremendous value out of it and told us it was far because the practical nature of it, right? It's the handholding. It's the, it's the, um, the fact that like we haven't made the intensive self-paced, the fact that we don't say here, let me teach you about due diligence. Here's a lecture. The fact that it's all customized and meets you where you are and gives you what you need when you need it. Like anybody can benefit from it. It, it doesn't. And, and there's no. There's no people that are better or worse. The big thing is like you have to have the money. And that's a that's the biggest hurdle for most people. You have to have the money to put into a business or have investors that are willing to back you. I won't accept anybody in the program that says I'll be looking for investors um, because I don't feel confident that that's the best use of their money at this stage of where they're at. Because in order to actually get someone to write you a check is a far cry from having somebody say, oh yeah, I'll back you. Like bring me a deal. Like I'll be interested, right? Like actually getting people to be able to take that leap to get the funds um, is probably one of the biggest hurdles that people will face that don't have the money. They'll have a bunch of people telling them they'll give them money, but no one will actually give them the money. Um, And so I think that the number one criteria is you have a way to fund the deal. We won't work with anyone that wants to use seller financing only. We have members who do deals like that, but it's because the deal structure, like the risks of the deal warranted that structure, right? That wasn't their primary strategy. Um, We won't work with anyone. I had a guy one time on a call, God willing, if you're watching this, I, I'm not meaning this insulting. Um, but he said, I want to buy a business. I want to be making a hundred thousand dollars in free cash flow in three months' time, I think. Um, and I said, Okay, awesome. How much do you have to uh to fund this? It's like thirty thousand dollars. I'm like, when you figure out how to turn thirty thousand dollars into one point two million dollars, I will back you. I want to jump on that train, right? Like there has to be a basis of logic. Like you have to be able to actually achieve this. Um, I don't care about your background, really. Like we have we have a woman in our current cohort um, who is reentering the workforce, right? She was off for 10 years raising her family. Her and her husband are buying a business for her to focus on. <clears throat> That's Interesting. fine. Interesting. That's fine. You, you mentioned the word intensive there. Can you dive a little bit into... The, the structure that people are going to be, you know, learning how to buy a business uh, and what they learn. And is it self-paced? Is it structured? What is it all about? So we have um, a hybrid model. So it's a four week intensive. It runs two tracks. Um, they are live workshops that are Walker's instructions simulcasted in the first half. And then it's led by a technical advisor in the second half over Zoom. Um, those are all we call it the buyer preparation track. So it's figuring out who you are what role you should be playing in the uh, organizations that you're buying, what your type of business you should be buying, what your target statement is, what your value is as a buyer, how to communicate that to the market. Um, we do a workshop with a lender so that you have a safe place to ask questions before actually uh, being in a position where it could potentially jeopardize your brand. Uh, our members get pre-approved. We have uh, lending partners that can do that for you. Um, and then the last session is really just an ask me anything with Walker. And so he does a kickoff call at the very beginning and he does a closing Q and a session with all of our members. Um, that's the track one. And that happens typically on Wednesdays from four to six central. And then on Thursdays, we drop pre-recorded content. Um, so we got a lot of pushback. We originally launched the lab with an eight week, pro- uh, pro- like a programming and we got feedback that that was too slow. And I didn't want to make the whole program self-paced like everybody wanted. Cause I, I know humans and humans don't do things when they're self-paced. And so I didn't want to allow the buyer preparation track to be self-paced because I didn't trust that people would do it. And I truly believe that's why I felt so comfortable throwing my career away as everyone told me I was doing when I came to build the lab. Um, Because I think if you anchor in that, you really can't go wrong. Like if that is your North star, you should be golden. Um, And so we have a second track that is pre-recorded that I felt like everybody wants when they join the lab. So the likelihood of them doing it is high. And that's how to get deal flow, how to evaluate listings once they start flowing across your uh, plate using a very structured framework, right? Um, We found that our members were diving into financial analysis too quickly on deals that made zero sense and they'd spend for weeks. Like this isn't even a good deal for you. What are you doing? 
Um, and so now we force them into this little checklist and this little calculator and we say, if it looks good, then evaluate the listing. And that really dives into the business and is the business the right one for you? And then if it is at the end of the full evaluation, then you do the financial analysis, which is the third week. And so that's like your um, financial analysis is three or forecast, break even analysis, scenario planning tools, that kind of stuff. Um, we teach all that through a case study. Uh, as an IO psychologist, I wanted to ensure that people were actually learning. <laughs> it wasn't just a bunch of videos. And so we built a case study, but based off of a quiet light listing, I scrubbed and, and changed to protect the anonymity um, and confidentiality. But it's a, an amazing way for people to learn. Right. It's a very robust listing. It will help them um, teach them when they're missing other things from other listings. And so giving them a chance to learn from one of the best listings um, and run through our entire process as a group um, is one of the most valuable parts of the lab. I think I would love to do monthly case studies, honestly, but they're kind of a pain in the ass. How many people are in these cohorts? I never go larger than 23 seats. And I say seats because I don't charge double for partners because we really want partners to go through the program together. Mm -hmm. um, and so you'll, it's 17 is like my sweet spot, but you'll never see it go larger than 23 seats. And so these 17 to 23 people are all going through it together and they get to know each other a little bit better. And do they have a tendency to talk to and rely on each other than, more than the rest of the group that was in other cohorts? Yes, but only for a short period of time, because once you finish the intensive, you move into the larger community. And then I start to see relationships being built um, because they need each other on the office hour calls and they start to get entwined in each other's deals. And so like when somebody will post their, you know, when I say, hey, congratulations, so and so closed when they're thinking people, I'm like, how the hell do you know that guy? <laughs> because they're from such different cohorts, but it's people start to build relationships. And then I also <laughs> because we have gotten so many members, I built a directory so that our members could find local, um, like who's in your area that you could start to actually meet face to face with. Um, and so we're also now seeing them start to build relationships locally, um, which I think is amazing. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. I look back to when I bought a business, I, I sold my business in 2010. I thought, damn, I'm smart. I could do this. I'm going to buy one now. Right. And I rushed and I bought something that I didn't understand, which was a content site. Uh, I went through due diligence on my own. Uh, and then 31 days after I bought it, it got hit by Google algorithm update and all those um, fake links that were in the business driving traffic to page one uh, got dropped to page two, three, four, five, six. And I lost a quarter of a million bucks in about uh, nine months. So uh, this is why I love, you know, the, the buying education services of, of things like the lab. I just, I know that um, if, if I said to my wife, Hey, honey, I, I want to buy a business. She's going to be like, no, no, look what happened last time you did it. And this is somebody who is an owner of quiet light brokerage. Who's been doing this now for a decade. She would still be very fearful of me buying. And, and then I'd have to say, no, 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 we're going to, we're going to, we're going to connect with Chelsea. We're going to go through the lab. We're going to do it together because we're partners and we're going to do it right. It's um, it's, I think for the audience that's thinking about buying, I think for the most part, you only get one chance of doing it right. If you screw it up, it's going to be a lot harder to convince investors to give you money or to talk to your spouse about taking a home equity line and investing or whatever it might be. So you kind of got to get it right the first time. And I think it's a worthwhile investment to spend some money learning how to do it right. Any thoughts on that? Yes. And I think, I think you're absolutely right. But I also, one thing I love about the lab that it is different than other um, speakers on the topic is like, we are not glamorizing buying a business. It is an absolute shit show, but it's your shit show, <laughs> right? And so you get to decide how to handle the challenges, but there will be challenges. And I always say like, you could do a million dollars of due diligence on a million dollar deal. You still will not catch everything. You just can't. It's just not the way it works. There are things that won't show up in due diligence because it's a cyclical thing, right? Or there are things that you'll miss and that's okay. I just saw a video of an athlete actually. Um, and God love him. I don't remember his name because I don't do sports, but it was Joe Valley. <laughs> it was Joe Tough Valley. Guy. Yeah. But an, a reporter had asked him if he viewed the entire season as a failure. Um, because they didn't win the championship. And his response was so beautiful in saying, no, my entire, like an entire career is aiming at progression, right? And I've won championships. Every year isn't going to be a championship. And it's the same thing with buying businesses. You will make mistakes. 
right? It's just going to happen. Um, the key is that you have done everything you can in your power to hedge the risk as much as you possibly can. And also why if somebody has $100,000, that's their life savings, they're going to try to buy a business, I won't work with them. Like yeah. you should not buy a business with no cushion. The SBA won't even let you actually, if you think about post-close liquidity, right? Um, because there are, me- like we had one member buy a business and he never made an SBA payment from the business. He had to pay it out of pocket every time because he bought a business who's the only one to buy in a certain industry that none of our members are buying in because it's high risk. Um, and it was very narrow margins. Inflation got him, the interest rate hikes got him and talent got him, mm. right? And so like, but thankfully he had enough of his own liquidity to pay the payments and sell the business and, and get out from under it. But like, it can have big, this is a big choice. It can have catastrophic results, right? No, nobody should be hiding that. Nobody should be acting like go out and buy a business as a way to make easy money. It's not easy money. Like another person I was talking to was talking about buying a window washing company. And they're like, well, I can just buy a window washing company. That seems simple. Do you want to, do you want to be on there doing window washing? If you don't want to do the work you're buying, that's a pretty risky business to buy because if everybody quits. You know, I, I gotta, I gotta say, I, I, I love the fact that you don't glamorize buying a business. I've, I've seen the other ads for your competitors and it's all just so easy and you can do it with no money down and it's bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. I can't stand it uh, because nobody is going to come to quiet light and buy one of these businesses with no money down. People have worked their whole life to build these businesses and they're not going to sell it to somebody without getting something for it up front, some skin in the game. Um, at the same time, we all know that if you're buying a business versus starting a business, you're likely to be much more successful. Uh, but still, you don't glamorize it. I love that about the lab. So good on you. Good job. Um, how how do people learn more about the lab? Where do they go? I know it's not just the lab. It's acquisitionlab.com. When are the next cohorts? Those types of things. How can they learn more? So acquisitionlab.com. Um if you want to dig even deeper, go to our frequently asked questions. Um, I put, I want to say 30 of my most <laughs> frequent questions and all the answers. So it's pretty robust. Um, if you're interested in applying, click the apply now button. Um, that application uh, just helps us, helps me honestly understand how best to structure the call with you um, to make sure that you get the most out of your time and that I can figure out if it's a fit for the lab or not. Um, you can learn more about kind of Walker and his approach through our YouTube channel. We're constantly uploading content to that. Um, Bythenbuild.com for um, information about the book. Uh, we also have a masterclass um, that does not overlap with the lab. Um, it's really a foundational course that I built to support his book. So it's a, just additional depth to the concepts in the book, but it's not um, like a accelerator, right, for execution the way that the lab is. Excellent. I love it. Folks, if you're thinking about buying a business, don't do it on your own. Check out uh, the lab at acquisitionlab.com and certainly go out and buy, buy, then build, as we've talked about for several years now on the podcast. Um, Walker's a good friend. He is very successful here uh, at Quiet Light as an advisor and doing some great things with Chelsea uh, in the lab as well. So don't risk your life savings on buying a business without the support that you need as Chelsea said it can be a bit of a, a bit of a shit show. So be careful, be wise, and don't make the same mistakes I did. Chelsea, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.